Hello, welcome to the first episode of the Thoughtful Solutions Podcast. I'm your host, Matt. I'm your co-host, Chris. And uh, this is going to be a podcast talking about a variety of things, but mainly revolving around socioeconomics and the need for a shift in our global socioeconomic system to just kind of solve all the issues that uh, we see around the world and just kind of presenting a different perspective on uh, how we can better the world here. So as a few prefaces, these topics are rather complex, and if anybody is interested in diving a bit deeper and looking at more academic and and researched kind of perspectives, I'm going to provide some links in the description below to a few things, the first one being a book called The Zeitgeist Movement Defined. It's a free PDF that you can download from the link, and this will have the main train of thought along with, I think, around 800 sources that are referenced in the piece. Another thing is going to be various works from people we're going to talk about like Stafford Beer and some of the work presented by Peter Joseph. You know, Stafford Beer and Peter, they have tons of lectures you can find online and a lot of source material. It's it's really good stuff to to watch. But um without further ado, one preface is some of the things we're going to talk about is is not going to be in a very malicious kind of kind of aspect. We want to come at this from a very objective point of view, but we want to make this a very uh, easy going talk, making it a bit more casual and just having a good back and forth so that it's uh, more digestible for whoever might be listening. But without further ado, the first topic today is going to be a discussion about system science and socioeconomics. And I want to start off this discussion by introducing an interesting historical uh, occurrence that happened in the 1970s. This is talking about the country of Chile. There was a democratic election in 1970, and a man named Salvador Allende got elected to the presidency of Chile. He wanted to bring about a lot of change in Chile. To you know, Chile is a very poor country not a lot of resources, and especially during this time, there wasn't a ton of access to you know, outside resources, and, and the country is very much still in a developmental stage. And being elected, he wanted to reorient the country to be more self-sufficient and to just increase kind of the overall public health outcomes of the country as a whole. Salvador Allende was a doctor, and he very much understood the necessity of making sure that the country as a whole was as healthy as it could be. So one of the ways that Salvador Allende went about doing this is he reached out to a man named Stafford Beer. Stafford Beer was a, he's a PhD from the University of London in mathematics. He helped start the development of a field called cybernetics or system science. And Cybernetics as a concept was brought about in the 1960s through, I think, 10 different conferences that were held in New York. And there were many different scientists that met and kind of ironed out what the system sciences would be, more of an interdisciplinary kind of look at overall system design and all the intricacies there within. So Salvador Allende went out and hired Stafford Beer to come in and really help reorient the the economy of Chile because Salvador knew that the economy was the main function of a country providing for the good of the people. So the main thing that, that Stafford Beer did when he got there is he started to develop different models. And one of his main works that he was uh, that he was like involved in was the creation of what's called the viable system model. And Salvador, being a doctor, he very much was understanding of a lot of the relationships that Stafford Beer correlated with nature. Nature is the perfect example of a viable system. There are no need for different system inputs as it operates wholly within its own parameters and is in essentially what's considered a steady state. So, Stafford Beer came to the country, he met with a lot of the different ministers, you know, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Internal Affairs, the different representatives of the different industrial sectors, and they got together and created various models to help reorient Chile's economy. 
the main way that he went about doing this is creating a, a few different models and, and diagrams and whatnot. And the first one he created was what's called the the five tier um, the five tier model. So the first tier would be the the factories, the various economic inputs. The second tier would be the external inputs, the environment, uh, different outside entities. The third tier would be the workers and kind of the more laborious inputs from the country into the system. The fourth element would be the overall management of the system and the communications behind it. And the fifth one, Stafford Beer was prepared to say this El Presidente would be you. And very much in a change of fate, Salvador Allende had a big eyes wide open moment and he was like, ah, the people. The people are the ultimate function of the system. They are the ultimate layer that ties everything together. And they were able to accomplish a lot within only two years. Unfortunately, as they were trying to reorient, reorient Chile's economy and whatnot to be more based off of these, these new scientific principles, there was a U.S.-backed coup from what was called the Junta. You know, they went into Santiago with, with guns and whatnot, shot up the, the Capitol building, and, and essentially toppled Salvador's government at the time. So, Chris, as I've talked to you before, it was very interesting how they did this. So... They had like really old technology, you know. They the Chile is a really long, skinny country, and then all these kind of systems were linked together from like telex machines and radio and stuff. I mean, well, what do you think with what they were trying to do with trying to to get the system off the ground and how much they were able to accomplish? And they did not have much in the seventies. We know uh, at the time. I remember talking about how they had one computer and. I mean, you know what they did, but that was smart putting it in the most center, centerly middle town, middle city that they could in Chile, basically. Yeah, which was Santiago, which is pretty much smack Santiago. dab in the middle of the country. <laughs> yeah, for communications, which was, like you said, I think one of the levels, one of these tiers to the five layers, you want to be right in the middle where everything has the shortest amount of time to come get to you. Makes Makes the most sense, but. You know, to work with what you got back then, and which uh, clearly isn't a lot, and to still, and like you said, they had about two years before this coup. That's that's pretty impressive. Not gonna lie, just trying to get your communications. The most important thing to start any type of operation is being able to communicate throughout, and then it's a whole country you have to cover. And they, the models that we've looked at, they've definitely did the best they could with what they had. Yeah, for sure, and. That that was another thing that Stafford Beard talked about was a lot of the other more traditional modes of of economic calculation and and kind of policy was based off of pretty outdated data. There would be six to eight months of lag between the economic data of the previous quarter or two before it would actually be implemented into currency change, inflation rate changes and stuff. Whereas if this economy is based off of more of a real-time communication between the different sources of, of the economic input, could, you could manage the system a lot more easily and make it, again, more, more responsive and, and just more instant. Uh, yeah, more instant, more redundant, and uh, mm-hmm. just, just overall improving things. But it's, it's good to talk about this because it's the first kind of example. There, there were other examples of, like, you know, communist Russia was doing something different and, like, Cuba and stuff, but they... As we all know, they turned into very authoritarian, very dictatorial, violent regimes that that really didn't go anywhere. But but this is the first example of a country basing their system off of science and having the people as the main orienting factor of how the economy was run, as opposed to you know big business interests and large multinational corporations money. and money and and having yeah. all this kind of stuff. He uh, Allende was able to nationalize, I think, around 60% of, of Chile's economy. So having these these kind of inputs, they were able to try and do a lot. I think one of the main things, you know, he increased the literacy rate by over 66% within two years, which is crazy to think about. Nice. Public health outcomes were, were much better. People actually had access to doctors and stuff. 
and malnutrition, all that kind of stuff was definitely on a downward trend. But again, it only happened for, for two years. So it was kind of a blip in history that a lot of people don't know about. If you guys want to learn more, I'll put a link in the description. It's called Project Cybersyn. Cyber, C-Y-B-E-R, Syn, S-Y-N. Cyber Synthesis was the whole name, but it's it's a very interesting read. But, but the reason that I wanted to start off talking about that is Stafford Beer modeled this, again, off of what was called a, a viable system. And as I had mentioned... Nature is the best example of what a viable system is because we all come from nature. We know how uh, how much of 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 you know without nature we we wouldn't be here. That that's the entirety of our existence is based around the natural world, the places where we come from, the things we've evolved from, and and the planet that we live on. So, moving into another leg of the discussion is again kind of honing in on what a viable system is and what a non-viable system is. So, to, to be quite frank, the main global socioeconomic system that, that everything is run under these days is, is what's called free market capitalism. I think we're all vaguely familiar, you know, market principles and stuff, it, it orients the entirety of our lives right now. Everybody works for an employer, and that, that's kind of the main orienting factor of our modern society, and, and has been for thousands of years. And as we're going to go on in this discussion, we're going to mention how increasingly the system has become non-viable as time has gone on, and especially especially since we've broken something of what's called the Malthusian trap. So moving a bit further, we're going to talk about what is socioeconomics and what are the basic tenets of free market capitalism. Think back to your, your high school economics class and whether you passed or failed, that's, that's irrelevant, but um, kind of the basic tenets of, of how the system functions. So if, if you can try and relate to your, to your high school knowledge here, Chris, what, what do you think the, the basic tenets of, of free market capitalism are? Oh, free market capitalism. Well, there's always, everyone's heard of supply and demand again and again. You know, that's like one of the main things that goes hand in hand with capitalism but also terms like scarcity and rarity free market capitalism basically i mean it is a system that we're that we've been using like you said for thousands and thousands of years and i know we've put it under the non-viable category because of how many things it just doesn't operate correctly and like that, i know we're going to get into that too the externalities the I like the how the regulators aren't able to keep up with the system these days because it just it's not powerful enough mm-hmm. and all of these things. It actually all uh it is a lot clearer now that we talk about it going back to this topic after so long. Um just what are the downfalls of the free market capitalism that like you might not even see if you're not really looking, but that's constantly happening and nothing's out there trying to rectify it. Oh, for sure, That's and good. some That's of the, again, the basic kind of system that, that we've all learned from our high school economics class, you have your employees, which are hired by capitalists who, who own the means of production, but the employees and the capitalists are also consumers, so they, they kind of feed back into the system. Your employees are employed so they can get money to buy things, to, to mm-hmm. live and, and participate in the economy. Right. And that feeds Other back in. Buying, I need to buy things. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And that and that feeds back into giving money to the capitalists so they can do more business and then they can expand and create more jobs or whatever to get more people money and, and it's that's kind of the cycle of the basic mechanism of how free market capitalism works. So looking at that there are some basic incentives that free market capitalism is based off of. That's kind of the mechanism, but some of the incentives, the main one is uh, maximizing profits. Any business, whenever it, it is in function, is looking to maximize profits no matter what the cost. That, that's kind of the thing. You know, you can look at some of the biggest businesses in the world, Amazon, the Walmarts, the, the Exxon Mobiles, all these kind of things. They work purely off of a profit motive. They have shareholders who are 
invested in the company and that, that's kind of the main mode that a lot of these institutions function off of. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's 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 all about making that dollar, you know. <laughs> um mm-hmm. But unfortunately, as as Chris had kind of touched on, there there are some things in this mechanism that are are just not considered. There's a lot of negative outcomes. Anybody can look at the world and see the amount of malnutrition, the amount of unnecessary death, the amount of poverty in the world. Yeah, again, environmental destabilization probably being the the biggest issue that that we face in this modern day. And all of these things are consequences of the socioeconomic system because, again, that is the main orienting root structure of what modern society is based around is the market economy. So with that as kind of a, a topic here, I want to move into a bit more of the, the history of free market capitalism and, and where it kind of came from, uh, just, just to give a bit more context here. So throughout 98 to 99% of human history, we existed as egalitarian or or equal hunter-gatherer societies that were very much reliant on on our environment. You know, for hundreds of thousands of years, our ancestors roamed in small tribal communities, following the herds, following different food sources. And that's that's kind of how we existed for, again, 98 to 99% of human history. Some socio-archaeologists consider this gift economies. Uh, some just call it hunter-gatherer society, stuff like that. That's We, we all kind of know this. You think of it, you know, the caveman era type deal. Um, now, when I say egalitarian or, or equal in the society, there was no money. You know, everybody had to move. You, you carried what you had on your back. You, you were with your small little family group. Everybody had their, their hunting spears, you know, at least the, the, the men who could hunt, even the women who would tag along. And, and that was kind of the mode for a lot of human society because, again, our, our technological means were, were very much based around our ability to just survive in the wilderness and eke out a living where we could. But oh, it, Absolutely. Yeah, and and it was very much a, a a different kind of kind of existence compared to compared to what we think about today. Um, oh yeah, I think uh, you're even just the individual value back then. You know, the compared to what your kind of life is valued as today, mm-hmm. um, you were way more important to your community and that type of society than a lot of people either put themselves at or actually are at now. Even if you were a, a man that should be a hunter, if something happened and you were injured, they still they aren't going to try to leave you behind or kill you. They still need you. Yeah, human populations were so spread about in this time that, like, you know, another thing is if you had a group of people meeting another group of people, your first instinct isn't, oh, let's go raid these people and, and stab, them to, stab them to death and take their stuff. No, you're like, oh, my God, I just met other people which is something that wouldn't have been a, a common occurrence. You're like, oh my gosh, these are different people. Let's try and communicate with them, work together, and then figure out how, how we could exist and build the larger community. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and then as human population sizes increased over time, uh, we get to a period in history called the Neolithic Revolution. Again, you can go back to uh, your high school history classes and stuff, and the Neolithic Revolution was the advent of agriculture, which a lot of historians and archaeologists and stuff have estimated happened around 12,000 years ago. This is when the first people kind of settled down yeah. in larger communities, started farming various plants and crops that were found out mm-hmm. in our greater environment. And, and of course, we're talking, you know, the Fertile Crescent, Mesopotamia, this type of deal. Oh, yeah, of course. Those were the... Uh, the first big the first yeah changes in society for to uh to not not from hunter gather anymore but totally switch into we're gonna stay here and farm yeah exactly and the neolithic revolution set in order a few different principles and that's why this is the starting point of what you could call you know, the rudimentary market economy uh, the Neolithic Revolution set in motion the basis for, for property or, or the ownership of things, capital, the means of production, yep. labor specialization, different jobs, uh, and eventually it evolved into regulation, as in the government, and protection of these uh, stockpiling 
stockpiling of resources as in, you know, the military, the police, rudimentary law systems and stuff. In other words, you have grounds for what is now the ultimate mechanism of survival, the market system of economics. You can look throughout history, this eventually evolved into some of the first civilizations. You know, you look at the Egyptians and stuff, and even uh, previous civilizations in like 6000 BC, this eventually evolved into the, the Mycenaeans and then the Greeks and the Roman Empire and everything. And this kind of evolved into kind of different forms of uh, free market capitalism. It evolved into, you know, as I mentioned, the Roman Empire and then into feudalism. And then after the the late medieval period, it evolved into mercantilism, the 15th, the 16th century and beyond, uh, which evolved uh, eventually into the more modern type of, of free market capitalism that, that we're used to, uh, which was pretty big in the 18th century and, and beyond there. Even different forms like uh, socialism, communism, all these things, they're not wholly different than free market capitalism. You know, a lot of people talk about these things as a boogeyman. You know, oh, this is kind of the, the, the bad thing that, that, that we need to stay away from. When in reality, communism still had private property. They still had money. They still had markets. They still had jobs and labor specialization. They still had all of the basic paradigm of, of employers and consumers. And But instead of the capitalists being the production means type entity, it was obviously the state. And then socialism is is more of a welfare state ideology, but to a lesser extent, that still revolves around markets, money, and all those principles that I just mentioned. So uh, an interesting tangent is talking about during the 1940s and 50s, when the, the field of sociology was, was really picking up a lot of steam, some of the early sociologists went out into places like the Amazon, some parts of Africa, where they still had modern-day hunter-gatherer societies. And they were able to really get a good look at how these societies differentiated themselves from the modern system that was evolving. You know, this is after World War II, and, and the concept of globalization really took place. And they were able to study these societies and really learn a lot. I, I, I'm not sure about any particular sociologists off the top of my head, but you can do plenty of research into some of these societies. It, it's very interesting to see a lot of their, were very much a gift-giving economy. They were not about reciprocation, so they actually found it quite offensive if you gave them something in return, if they gave you a gift, because they felt the, the concept of friendship was supposed to be more of an autonomous thing, like you shouldn't ex expect somebody to give you something very much free-flowing, not a lot of sexual taboos, and just very much a different mode of uh, organization. There's a lot of interesting uh, studies around that. But kind kind of bringing it back to, to what we're talking about with the free market capitalism, there are a few big things that play into the idea of the system not being viable. So the first one, and Chris, I'll have you talk about this a little bit. So the concept of planned obsolescence. What is planned obsolescence and why is it so bad? And, and I think a lot of people, when you hear this, you might not know what it is off the top of your head, but... The second that we They've explain it, yeah, it. you'll you'll know. <laughs> so what you is absolutely it? Absolutely experienced it. I mean, I'm using a phone right now, and I, it's uh, iPhone 11. It's my fourth or fifth smartphone that I've owned in the past few years because the old one keeps breaking and just not being compatible for whatever stupid reason, and I have to go spend money and get a new one. And that you could say that it, you, people get want to get upgrades and blah, blah, blah. But if you're not that type of person, if you didn't want to have to go get a new phone, doesn't matter. That phone still broke, and I had to go dish out $800 for this one. And that's kind of the obsolescence side of planned obsolescence, which is where you're doomed from the start. Whatever you go and spend your money on is designed to fail at some point. Yep. And sometimes, very obviously... To the point where you just know you're going to have to go get another one. And you've probably heard any, uh, especially the people of the older generation, um, talk about how their fridge lasted for 30 years. Or, uh, you know, their car from the mm -hmm. 60s will still turn over to this day. 
And there's actually a truthful aspect to that because nowadays things that we nowadays things that we have, they could just break on you on purpose so that whoever made it could sell you another one. And it's it's hard to just easily point out when that happens that, oh, this is the bad guy. I could go sue them. This bridge shouldn't have broke right now. But there's enough paperwork and there's enough red tape between like trying to explain the warranties of that specific part to keep you from ever getting gaining any foot on getting a replacement or getting your money back. No, you're just going to have to pay something extra now to fix that if you want to keep it going. Oh, and- yeah, for sure. It's, it's built into the way that business is done. Products are designed to have a short lifespan so that they incentivize repeat purchases. As you mentioned, cell phone companies, the automotive industry, a lot of modern technology, you know, we have a really big issue with, with electronic waste in our modern society. It's it's oh, yeah. all designed to fail from the get go. Right. Uh, a exactly. really yeah, a really interesting thing is, is something called the, the centennial light bulb. I believe it's in Philadelphia, if I'm not mistaken. There is a fire station where the light bulb and electricity was was really getting going around the eighteen eighties, eighteen nineties and before the the big light bulb cartels got involved, these light bulbs were designed to last for decades. Uh, the Centennial light bulb, I believe, is still uh, running. If if not, it it's lasted quite a while, and it's been going for at least a hundred years. If if not a hundred and twenty, if it's still going. Mm-hmm. So very much before the the modern adaptation of free market capitalism you know we're talking like the 1920s and and onwards in tandem with like modern advertising and marketing and stuff things were designed to last you know as chris said a lot of people in the older generation remember when things were built to last and and that was but but unfortunately in the current market paradigm with maximizing profits being the biggest incentive for business People have realized in this business community that you're not making as much money if you're building products that are designed to last for a long time, as opposed mm-hmm. to, again, having to incentivize these repeat purchases. So mm-hmm. that's that's the concept of planned obsolescence. I'm going to touch on this next one is, is another concept called externalities. So again... Go back to your high school days. You may, 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 may or may not remember this, but an externality is a basic concept in free market capitalism where it is something that the system holds its hands up to its eyes and says, nope, I'm not responsible for this. It's not a part of our economic equation, and it's, it's not designed to be rectified as a system consequence. So good examples are things like poverty, public health outcomes, pollution, environmental destabilization, recycling, trash, all of these kind of things that are a result of the market system functioning and are products of the system. You can think of it as the the things that are external to what the system is able to control. That's what an externality is. It's something that is not equated in how the system functions. It's not something that the system is designed to solve. That's why we have such issues like we're we're currently in the midst of the sixth great mass extinction. Since the 1970s, we've seen over 50% of overall species count that we know of on the planet go extinct. Resource overshoot is out the wazoo. Right now, it's estimated that we pull three and a half times what the planet can regenerate every year in terms of resources. And it's estimated by 2050, we'll need, I think, 21 or like 27 Earth's worth of resources that can be regenerated to meet current economic output and demand. So it's it's just crazy to think about these uh, some of these things. You know, and, and kind of another aside to externalities is the, the concept of inequality. And we talked about the, the pre-Neolithic people, the hunter-gatherer societies, we talked about an egalitarian or an equal society where everybody was on the same kind of playing field because everybody had to work together to survive. But in this reality, inequality is built into the system. That's why we have different things like the poor, the low class, the middle class, the upper middle class, and then your 
your millionaires, your billionaires, your your captains of industry, your politicians, these kind of things. And inequality is very much a caustic situation in society. It does nothing but breed stress and friction between the lower classes and the upper classes. But obviously, with the majority of the planet being on that lower end of the inequality spectrum, that's why we see, you know, so many billions of people who live on like a dollar twenty a day. We see a billion people who are malnut who suffer from malnutrition, don't have access to clean water, all these kind of things. It's it's very much built into the system as as an incentive because capitalism is very much a zero sum game. You're going to have a very few amount of people who own the majority of the wealth and the means, whereas the bottom portion of the planet is is left out in no man's land and kind of has to fend for yourself. An interesting thing that I've seen is modern society is very much rugged, individualist, free market capitalism for the lower classes, and it's it's pure socialism for the upper classes. They get all the subsidies, they get all the tax breaks, they can afford to, to stuff their money in offshore bank accounts and and, and just get so many more benefits compared to what your average person does. Mm-hmm. So so feeding into this, you know, as I had mentioned uh, as the preface to this podcast, well, what I'm about to mention, uh, I'm not demonizing these people. I'm not saying they're evil. I'm not saying they're bad. While their behaviors might be that way, they're very much the epitome of what free market capitalism uh, kind of creates. So some examples would be like Bill Gates, Jeff Bezos, you know, these kind of individuals with obscene amounts of wealth. Just having a hundred billion dollars, I mean, Bezos probably has way more than that now. Like, can you even fathom what you do with that? And, and you don't even have to. You, you look at what these people do. You know, yeah, Bill Gates does some philanthropy here and there. He helps some people in, like, Africa and stuff. But as a whole, a lot of these people are just sitting on their money. It just sits in a bank account and makes more money, when in reality, these are the people with the most power to try and help alleviate a lot of the system issues that occur from the system itself. So, yeah, Chris, when you look at some of these people that have all the means in all the world and and all this money and all this power... Why do you think that they aren't doing anything to really change or better the system? It's kind of funny when you first mentioned that. Another one that came to mind immediately was the Waltons. Or, yeah, the, the Waltons, the perfect family, example, yeah. yeah. <laughs> family that owns Walmart. But, mm-hmm. no, as far as why they, like the, these types of families and these types of people, aren't doing anything, well, as if from their point of view, why should they? What, you mm-hmm. know, they, there's there's no... There's no reason for them to worry themselves about it. They're not incentivized to to take on something that isn't going to uh, give them more money, isn't going to produce more money or make a profit or be turned around to gain something of some kind. Like I think you and I had talked about before, it could be really difficult for someone that gets that high in power to intentionally drop their you know their bank account, so to say. To, uh, to invest $40 billion into something uh, problem-solving for America that isn't going to just make money instantly. It's just going to cost money. They can do that. They, they have the means to do that 100%, but they're not, they're not incentivized to do it because they're not going to make any profit off of it. Yeah, like solving homelessness, helping the ecological crisis, you know, bringing a lot energy. of these energy, helping third-world countries have a higher standard of living, you know, yeah, they, again, they might go out and do some philanthropic, philanthropic work here and there and help get this little tribe some clean water or whatever. But as a whole, they're not changing what produced these outcomes in the first place. And, and you put it perfectly, these people are not incentivized to change because they are the epitome of what the outcome of the system produces. And they're at the top, they have that power, so so why would they change anything? Yeah, um, after using a system to your advantage, well, not to your, after using system the way it was created to allow, actually, mm-hmm. and and it working for you, and, uh, and, the, and the greatest way it could work for anybody, you're, you're not going to change the system that got you there. That doesn't make sense. Yeah, no. Not to someone who just gained, <laughs> you know, he was now a billionaire. No, exactly. And that, that actually feeds into another point here. So I'm I'm gonna 
propose to you guys a bit of a paradox. So this is called the market paradox. Quote, unquote, the market justifies its existence by the recognition of scarcity, but due to its structural mechanics, actually promotes and rewards infinite consumption. End quote. That that's that's the crux. You know, you have a system that's based off of constant turnover, constant economic growth, GDP growing by one to three percent a year, and then all these different metrics and stuff. Companies getting more market share and just growing, 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 selling, 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 taking everything and just spitting it back out. But then on the other hand, you have the concept of of artificial scarcity that drives the price mechanism, which is supposed to be like the main way that the system is oriented, something scarce, like a Ferrari or something, because they only make thousand or whatever, the price is going to be a lot different than, you know, a loaf of bread at the store that almost everybody needs access to. So, so that, that's kind of an inconsistency. You know, how can you have a system on a finite planet with finite resources that regenerate at set rates how can you have a system based off of infinite growth of consumption, but also have artificial scarcity be a main component of how the system functions? It just it, There's no right. logic there whatsoever. Exactly, which ties into how these big companies need to constantly make a profit. Like, for example, oil. The, obviously, it, the demand for oil is just going to keep growing as it is right now. I mean, there's no major changes using other forms of energy, we're just going to constantly suck in up oil all the time. So we're going we're gonna to run out of this shit at some point. And that would be that never-ending demand for, for an infinite amount of oil that just isn't there. It's, it's not going to happen. But at the exact same time as we're demanding an infinite amount of it, the price for that same exact oil, as it becomes more scarce, is going to just keep going up and up and up. So we're in a system right now where we're going to eventually be paying an insane amount for something because we needed it to be infinite and it's not, and there's nothing controlling its price. And till, till it burns out and people will probably start you know, deep in the future, maybe not 50, 70 years or whatever, could start doing horrible things for some oil. Yeah, exactly. And, and kind of another tangent is oil is a great example in terms of just the inefficiency overall. It's estimated that modern extraction methods, things like deep sea drilling, ocean shelf drilling, you know, all this kind of stuff, they actually take a lot more resources than what they actually produce. So it's estimated that it takes seven to eight barrels of oil in terms of setting up the oil rig, getting the people there, transporting the oil rigs to storage areas and stuff, seven to eight barrels of oil to produce one barrel. And yes, our our technology might get better in terms of extracting these resources more efficiently. But again, that's just going to keep on doing the same thing where we're putting more energy into extracting these resources as opposed to what we're actually getting to kind of keep the status quo going. It's just so doomed to fail at some point. And that doesn't even consider like, you know, again, with fossil fuels, a lot of these big companies are getting subsidies from different world governments like the United States, China, European countries. So they, they're just getting this free cash to, to help pod, to, to help pad their bottom lines and to make themselves more profitable. And it's, it's interesting because if you if companies and big businesses took in the concept of externalities in terms of the environmental costs, you know, all the things I had mentioned earlier, most if not all companies on the planet really are not profitable because think you can't put a price on making a species go extinct. We, we could have hundreds of trillions, even in the quadrillions worth of dollars of, of amount of damage that has been done, you know, again, you can't put a price tag on destroying a a bird species or whaling a a certain species to extinction. Like, like, again, you can't put price tags on these kind of things. So, all right, Chris, I'm going to ask you a series of three questions and I want to get your opinions and, and your answers on these three questions. And for you listeners, just think about these as well. 
and, and consider what your answers might be. You know, maybe leave that in the comments or just uh, maybe you could shoot us an email. I'll leave a link to the email uh, in the description. So the first question is going to be such. So given that the market economy requires consumption in order to maintain demand for human employment and to further economic growth as needed, is there a structural incentive to reduce resource use, biodiversity loss, and global pollution footprint, and hence assist in the ever-increasing need for improved ecological sustainability in the world today? So is there a basic structural incentive to reduce the negative externalities that we see from the system? Well, no. No, I, I, not really, because to for them to be incentivized to say to say have less of a footprint that would go against needing more consumption. And there's like, no money it, in it. There's no money in solving these things. <laughs> right, right. Again, it's just going to cost you. It'll cost you more. And like, if your product that you're providing to somebody is you're constantly trying to create more of it, so you can sell more and make more money and everything then you, you're con- trying to get your consumption as high as possible. Uh, you're you're going to have a higher rate of, of external problems. And there's the, to, to check yourself on that, to be able to try and create some incentivized reason out of nowhere to now be on, you know, stop using as much as you're using or be more responsible, take more uh, uh, bills as far as handling your waste or where you're getting your power from. Now you're losing money. Oh yeah. So exactly. I don't think they're not they're not incentivized to try and do that. You know the way the way the structure is right now. No, they're not. not yeah, and I that. had uh, mentioned something earlier called the Malthusian trap, and I think this is a perfect little time to add this in. So no longer is our society truly scarcity based; it is wholly consumption based. The Malthusian mm-hmm. trap was proposed by uh, you know it is kind of modeled off of a 19th or I think it was late 18th, early 19th century uh, economist named Thomas Malthus. And there's a chart that I can put up where throughout the entirety of human history, your average income of, of your average person has been pretty steady. You know, there have been little increases and little dips in terms of like peasants and your, and your merchants and all this kind of stuff. But during the Industrial Revolution in the mid 1800s, we broke the Malthusian trap. And the best way to explain it is the trap is our ability to increase uh, economic efficiency. Before the Industrial Revolution, we were kind of in a relative steady state with the amount of resources that we used because we simply didn't have the technology to extract resources faster than, than they could be regenerated. But once we started to get the machinery and the technology behind being able to do this, we were able to increase economic output. It allowed purchasing power to be a little bit more distributed to the lower classes, but it also rapidly and exponentially increased the amount of resources that we were able to consume in order to keep this economic machine going. So that's kind of the basic concept of the Malthusian trap. During the Industrial Revolution in the mid-1800s, we were able to break free of the trap because our technological means have exponentially increased as our efficiency has. And we are now in a state where, again, we're using three and a half times Earth's regenerative capacity for resources because we have the technical efficiency to actually increase this economic output beyond, uh, beyond these means. So going into the second question here, Chris... In an economic system where companies seek to limit their production costs or cost efficiency in order to maximize profits and to remain competitive against other companies, what is the structural incentive that exists to keep humans employed in the wake of an emerging technological condition where the majority of jobs can now be done more cheaply and efficiently by machine automation? So again, to to simplify it, companies as we noted before, are looking to maximize profits. What is their incentive to not mechanize and automate? You know, we already look at the automotive industry as the perfect example. 
why would companies not continue to automate, thus reducing the amount of jobs available? So uh, this one, this one, the incentive is it's it very, very few. Like there's not much you could find. Maybe one reason that you could try and put out there, it sounds more like an excuse actually, would be if you could continuously find human labor that actually was cheaper than your calculated costs of using a machine, which means I'm, at that point we're talking like sweatshops. Exactly. Type of stuff. Um, but other than that, like here in America where you'll, you'll have to have all of your employees and everything recorded and tagged with proper, proper numbers, basically um, it, it probably is cheaper to automate, especially positions where, you know, you might have to pay could be thousands of dollars throughout the year when a $5,000 machine gets it done for a few years. So yeah, that one, there's, there's not much incentive, especially not like, you know, morally correct or like morally good incentive at all to try and try and keep a human labor or a, a human workforce instead of lowering your costs with automate automation. Yeah, exactly. And I think you had brought up a really good point there about the morality behind it as well. There's are you going to keep these these burger flipping jobs, these ditch digging jobs just for the fact to keep people employed so that they can do these menial jobs so that they can make pennies on the dollar just so they can survive? Or again, is that a moral system? We We have the technical means to kind of free up a lot of the time it takes to do these kind of tasks and so it, it is a weird like moral perspective that you can look at it, but there's also, again, that purely incentive-based structure where you look at the outsourcing of, again, like factory jobs, the automotive industry, manufacturing, all this kind of stuff. We were already seeing the trends. And, and you know, one thing people might say is, oh, but as, as society advances, you know, we'll just come up with different jobs, the, the, all these new automated jobs will be replaced by different service sector jobs. Well, the trends aren't really bearing that out. But you look at the amount of people that are, are unemployed in today's society, it's it's growing and growing every year. And obviously, as populations increase, it's, it's going to increase exponentially as well. You had brought up the concept of sweatshop labor and stuff. We have more slaves today in modern society, I think it's estimated like 27 million sweatshop labor slash actual indentured type uh, slave situations than at any time in human history. And that is correlated with the global population, but it's still staggering to think about. When we have the means to to bring entire, entire populations out of these conditions. Oh, exactly. We have the technical means, but there's no... Uh, again, there's no yeah, there's no incentive for the system to change this trend. Um, Not in this for profit system that we have for sure. If it's all based on your profit, and this is all just going to cost you money, then no one's going to do it. No, not at all. And around the corner, I mean, we already see a lot of cashier jobs being taken away. You know, cashiers are unfortunately again another menial job that I don't think 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 of all just the potential Einsteins that are locked behind these really menial jobs that they, they have so much potential, but because they have to put their time and energy into doing things that is not intellectually stimulating to help kind of better society, think of all the human potential that's being wasted. It's, it's wasted. It's absolutely, absolutely crazy to think about. Including um, the negative effects on those people. Oh God. But. Yeah. The, again, the, the psychosocial stress of being poor, you know, a lot of, of negative health consequences have a large correlation to, to economic class. People who are in the wealthier ends of society, I think on average, live anywhere from 14 to 25 years longer than somebody in a poor rung of society. It's, it's crazy yeah. to think about that. Yeah. But moving on to the third and final question here, Chris. So in an economic system which inherently generates class stratification and overall inequality, how can the effects of structural violence, a phenomenon noted by public health researchers to kill well over 18 million people a year, 
generating a vast range of systemic detriments such as behavioral, emotional, and psychological disorders, again, as we touched upon with being in a lower class. How can those be minimized or even reduced as a consequence of the system? Again, you can think of, and we're going to talk about this in a second here, but you can think of structural violence as an externality. So how does the system deal with an issue like that? The system, I would say, for one, very poorly, mm-hmm. if not, you know, not at all. So, yeah, you know, because well, if by definition you are being affected by the system, if you're, if you're, you know, what's going on in your life, whether it be the inequality or the the cycle aspect of being in the lower class, something that's negatively affecting you. Um, what was the term that you had, you just said? Structural violence. Or, structure yeah the structure in that case you're already in a spot where the structure itself had no answer for you so to to try and figure out a way that the structure can start to minimize these things well it's failing it's obviously failing or else these things wouldn't wouldn't already be so prevalent or or even there at all um so it's not the system at all that could try to fix or minimize these these structural violence problems and in these cases, I would only be able to think of like private means or, or just, you know, you could say mm-hmm. good people who try to do things like food banks or yep. mental awareness things in their community, bettering education in their community and whatnot. Those can actually start to mend structural violence, educating the, the uneducated because they're, they have no means of getting educated type of thing. Yeah. That, and, that's and, one way. And that's kind of the what... The, the government is supposed to be this, this regulatory entity to help curtail the worst aspects of absolute free market system, when in reality, as we all know, most, if not all, governments around the world really work for the big business interests. You know, your, your average American has a statistically insignificant impact on what policies actually get introduced at, at a governmental level. It's yeah. always the big business interests, the rich people who who have a say because of the way that government and business are intertwined. You look at things like social welfare, these are supposed to mitigate some of these effects, you know, as you'd mentioned, Chris, volunteer efforts, community things like food banks and stuff like that, wellness programs. Yeah, but they're 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 really a band aid on the issue. You know, you again, it's right? You know, they're you, not they're not a system. The system isn't doing it at all. Mm-hmm. Like if you can't you can't just put a band aid on it if it's it's an internal problem with the system causing it, and that's what has to be addressed. Yeah, and, and, uh, the, and philanthropy again, as I had talked about earlier, you know, with like like somebody like Bill Gates does with the Melinda and Bill Gates Foundation, they go out to try and help some of these these communities in the world and those who don't have a lot but they they don't look beyond why these issues are occurring in the first place and and why these these countries and these people are in the situation that they're in in the first place and what is there to actually rectify the issue as opposed to just like oh here's a water filtration system here's some here's some MREs to to help get you by for the next month or two good luck <laughs> You know, exactly. type, type situations, right? Just like tying into the previous question, these these companies like the Melinda and Bill Gates Association, they're not incentivized to fix the problem. They could they could go and deliver as much food packages as they want. They're still going to try and sell as many Macintoshes or what? No, that's the wrong company. But you get you get the point. They're still yeah. going to try and do as much as they can, producing as much Microsoft out of that sweatshop as they possibly can. And that that even feeds into a lot of philanthropy being mostly for tax benefits as well. You know, they get a yeah. lot of tax breaks for <laughs> for doing these kind of things. But to kind of feed back into the larger discussion, so those are the three questions. But I, I want to touch on the concept of structural violence real quick. So in order right. to elaborate on that a bit more, structural violence is as opposed to somebody putting a gun to your head and pulling the trigger, you know, we all know that that is overt violence that any individual might, might do if, if there's psychological and social situation or, and, and their economic situation uh, is, is dire enough, but structural violence is the global deaths that occur from malnutrition, 
lack of resources, lack of health care, lack of clean water, lack of a good standard of living. All of these factors yeah. is what constitutes structural violence. And, and even for some like more modernized countries like the U.S. and Europe and things like this, structural violence also constitutes uh, issues with being in a lower socioeconomic class. So, you know, poor people have a way more higher propensity to get things like heart disease or to have psychological issues like schizophrenia, depression, you know, anxiety. These kind of issues are way more prevalent in the lower rungs of society. And again, as we had mentioned earlier, these lower classes have an, a, a shorter overall lifespan compared to those who are of more affluent means. So that's oh, yeah. that's the concept of structural violence. It's it's external issues or, or another externality, as I'd mentioned, that the system generates that it itself is not able to fix because there's no money to be made with solving issues like poverty. There's no money to be made besides throwing some pills in your face, you know, or, or going to some therapy sessions to, to fix things like depression and anxiety. So Definitely. that's that's yep. what the concept of, of structural violence is. And, and again, you can do a bit more research yourself. One of the biggest academic researchers of this topic is, is Dr. James Gilligan. Uh, he's a Harvard uh, psychologist who who worked initially in a lot of the prison systems in the United States. He has a ton of, of academic work on this, and you can go check that out. It's uh, Dr. James Gilligan. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah, I'll check that out. But uh, moving into the last, the last few points here so we can wrap up today's episode. So since we've kind of laid the found foundation, you know, what is free market capitalism? What are the basic incentives? What is a viable system versus a non-viable system, which is, again, something like free market capitalism, with a viable system being something that emulates nature or orienting itself on a more natural science-based level, the, again, viable systems versus non-viable systems. I want to touch on the concept of in-system and out-system thinking and activism. So unfortunately, right. you know, a lot of people in today's age, they, they know that there's a lot of issue going on. You know, you have, you had movements like Occupy Wall Street, Black Lives Matter, some of the ecological movements to help conservation and whatnot. All of these things are, are very much recognizing that there are systemic issues. But unfortunately, a lot of these movements are A, they don't have common goals. And, and there's no real baseline game plan to really change these things. But they're also trying to work within the system that generated these issues in the first place. Yes. So that's why, you know, on this podcast, as, as we get deeper into these topics, we're very much going to be proponents of out-system activism. So thinking of things beyond the current paradigm and the current zeitgeist. Because these are eventually going to be the things that will bring about real systemic change to really bring about a bettering of the root issues that cause a lot of these problems. Because at the end of the day, we, I think we all want to see things like poverty, hunger, malnutrition, not having enough access to resources, helping a lot of psychological and inequality-based issues. People want to see these things fixed. But if you're viewing it within the system that has created these issues, you're, you're going to just see little incremental change. And in all honesty, it's, it's not going to go far beyond, you know, some few, a few improvements here and there. Yeah, so, short-term bandages. Yeah, exactly. And that, that very much feeds into out-system activism as well, which is why I started off with the, the brief story of, of Chile trying to do something different with their economic orientation because they were very much trying to work in an out-system manner to help alleviate a lot of the issues that Stafford Beer, Salvador Allende, and a lot of those uh, the people working in the Chilean government at the time saw as the main contributors of those issues. So again, you got to pull yourself out of the current paradigm, take a top-down view, and say, hey, maybe it's the system as a whole that's causing these issues because, again, the whole global socioeconomic system of free market capitalism is how the planet works right now. That's how all the gears turn. 
And with that being the main system, that's what you need to start to look at to change. So the, the last point I want to touch on before we, uh, before we call it a day here is the concept of the law of requisite variety, or what is termed as Ashby's law. And, and it might sound a, a bit weird at first, but I'll, I'll explain this a bit more. So this law states that any kind of a regulator in a system needs to meet or exceed the complexity of the system that it regulates. Now, this this might sound a bit strange, but uh, a perfect parallel is is your nervous system. So you you don't you don't need to think about breathing. You don't need to think about setting your heart rate. You don't need to think about your blood pressure, your internal body temperature. All of these types of things are already regulated in a, in your you know in your nervous system. That's the perfect example of something that is a controlling mechanism of your body as a whole that meets or exceeds the complexity of again your body being the system that meets or exceeds that that other system. So the perfect parallel for something like free market capitalism is you, you could well, which obviously does not follow this law is something like the the Federal Reserve. The the main world reserve currency is the US dollar and the Federal Reserve is the main entity that regulates monetary policy with this currency. And if you look at, you know, some of the the mechanisms, the they, they can change interest rates and they can buy the U.S. bonds at, at different rates and stuff. And they might be able to do a few other little things behind the scene. But in reality, that regulator is not meeting or exceeding the complexity of the free market capitalism system as a whole. So that's why we see things like the boom and the bust cycle because these are going to occur because the system cannot regulate these these negative feedbacks into the system and you could even look at something like uh, you know the environmental protection agency the agency exists and it's trying to do good things to help stem ecological decline and destruction but you know you see headlines like the EPA's latest threat to economic growth or you know something like that where a lot of these entities and big business fight back against these kind of regulations because they see it as stifling the infinite growth paradigm. So, so what do you think when you hear about a concept like this, Chris? Well, that one, the, especially the example with the EPA specifically, that it just just goes back to how it could cost more than the, the making it to where there's no profit because all these companies see these regulations as our costs, you know, it's the opposite of them trying to win the system, which is profit. So they're going to try everything that they can to, you know, not, not let this type of thing happen. So that, that I see, I see exactly what you mean there. Oh yeah. And unfortunately with there not being much in terms of a regulatory body, because again, you need to have regulators in a system to make it viable. You need to have different levels of, of recursion, which I'm going to touch on before we end today's discussion, in order to have a system be viable. Because you have to have a way to control the system outputs and the system inputs in order to make sure that the system as a whole can function properly. Um, right, like good old Stafford Beer's communication attempts back in Chile, where he would have had the feedback instantly or at least as instant as possible. Mm -hmm. That's that's one huge reason that the Fed has such poor management of uh, the currency. Like how you mentioned, we're run on a quarterly basis here, yep. and they're using information from months ago, and it's incorrect now. Of course. <laughs> so it's literally a regulator that's behind on on what's happening now. It's gonna it's it, it the, the exact opposite of having more control or more ability to regulate. Than, than what you need. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, on a final note, the concept of recursion is very much an element of, of a viable system as well. So recursion is a mathematical term. You can think of things like the Fibonacci sequence or fractal patterns, things like this. But in terms of system science and what, what we're talking about today, Recursion is having systems within systems within systems because 
a complex system that is built to be viable needs to be made of smaller component parts that are also viable systems within themselves. So again, right. with nature being the ultimate viable system, take the human body again as an example. You can go exactly. all the way you can go all the way down to the quantum level and in the atomic level that is a viable system within itself. You know, you look at the evolution of the universe when the big bang happened, however that occurred, it started out with the atoms and and how those different elements were formed, but that eventually evolved into, you know, different elements and into planetary bodies and then into the first multi-celled organisms. Again, all of these different evolutions are viable within themselves. And then you look at things about how the cells started to, to clump together to form more complex organisms. And then you yep. have systems like, you know, the human body where different organs do different functions within themselves and are viable, but they also feed into the larger order uh, system, which is the human. And then you could look further as, you know, the human is a part of an ecosystem. An ecosystem is, is a viable system within itself. But then the ecosystem is also part of the biosphere, which again is a viable system within itself. Then you look at the the planet and then the solar system. All of these things are systems within systems within systems. And you can try and, and reduce down free market capitalism's components, but as you get down to the lowest levels, you don't see the level of recursion that is required to create a viable system. So it's it's a very important concept. And again, you can look at some of Stafford Beer's works. Um, he has some some really great lectures that you can listen to. But that I think is is a good note to leave off on. Free market capitalism is not a viable system. It creates a lot of bad outputs that I think a lot of people recognize. And all these externalities are here for a reason. And it's not because of some singular person's malicious intent to, to screw over this group or that group. You, you need to remove yourself from the individualistic components and look at it from a systems perspective. And you really start to understand why you know a lot of these occurrences are happening and how uh, we can start to kind of change things when we start to take this more outward view. We can really start to further discussions uh, down the road about how we can improve things. So as we're wrapping up here, Chris, uh, do you have any uh, anything else, anything final you want to say? Well, I think that this conversation now is, oh gosh, like five or ten times clearer than, um, than a few weeks ago when you and I started discussing things. And... Uh, I think that's just a, a great example of how this podcast itself, through all of the discussions and, of course, you know, getting deeper into uh, these topics in the next episodes and everything, is going to start to clear the waters, clear the muddy waters of what I'm trying to look at here as the big picture, because it's, it's much more understandable going through it now. Yeah, definitely. And that, that I think is a good point to kind of leave off on. Well, one of the goals for, for this podcast, the, the Thoughtful Solutions podcast, is, is we, we want to lay a groundwork for these kind of discussions. And as somebody goes through and listens to the different episodes that we're going to be producing, they build on each other. And it creates kind of a foundation so that as we talk about more tertiary topics, there's already kind of a base level of understanding and, and a certain perspective that is different than the norm. And it, it really yeah. helps present these ideas better light. Because ultimately, I think what everybody is looking for, again, you know, the, the name of the podcast is Thoughtful Solutions. We want to arrive at good solutions about how we can change the system and better humanity in the future. And just to, to make everybody's lives healthier, happier, to just increase, you know, abundance, public health, and to just really make the world a better place. Because unfortunately, the way that trends are going, there's a lot of a lot of things in the near future that that <laughs> unfortunately are not looking too pretty for us. So if if we can start to galvanize change around a fundamental understanding of system science, of socioeconomics, and and trying to help others and and to really bring people into the conversation. It's really big to help 
spread this picture and just really start again a conversation and to start the train of thought to help just better the world. You know, I think again, everybody wants to see things like poverty, stress, depression, anxiety, interclass struggles, racial struggles. You know, we all want to see these things fall to the wayside. And, you know, I think really everybody wants to be freed up. You know, we have the technical means at this point to better human society, but in terms of the society as a whole and the economic system, it's very much lagging behind our academic and technical understanding of what the world could be like if we start to, if we start to really galvanize change. So in future episodes, we'll definitely be talking about what solutions to the system look like and what these, these realities might manifest as. But again, we got to lay the foundation first before we can really get onto those topics. But Thank you, everybody, for listening. Uh, This is the first episode of the Thoughtful Solutions podcast, and uh, we will be catching you sometime soon. Uh, Have a good one, everybody. Later. All right.